Welcome back to part two of the skeleton key to Hannah's struggle for recognition. Um, we, I, I think, what I'm going to do, we, we've got, we've done enough of, of Hegel's uh, um, theory of recognition, and you can work your way through the rest of it uh, uh, from where we left off. I'm going to skip the uh, detailed discussion of Hannah's use of Mead. You know, for what it's worth, just just where this goes. Um, I'll just kind of draw it out really fast here, is that, is that to, to Hanneth, um, okay, so Mead had, let's see, Hegel had, um, what did he say, three sort of um, modes of recognition, right, or modes of mutual recognition. Uh, it was love uh, in the family. It was um, something like what, rights is the second one, legal rights, and the third one is, uh, I think in, in Hegel's words, it's uh, it's uh, esteem or something like that. I probably have this a little wrong. And then he tries to line this up with Mead's, um, you know, developmental sequence of of the I and the me. You know, so so in Mead, um, um, you know, the I is sort of the active agent of the self. Uh, the me is the reflective uh, self that. Uh, that is essentially um, uh, that results from the mutual that, that that results from the it's it's the um, self as reflected off of other. Okay, so um, so the I is the actor, the me is the self as reflected off of other, or that's projected ahead. Right, there's usually kind of anticipatory um, um, inner uh, conversation inner monologue or inner dialogue in in uh, in Mead, and so. Mead argues right, right. You begin um, developing a me uh, by interacting with a significant other, and of course, uh, in Freud, um, that significant mother, that, that significant other is primarily a mother. Something that Hanneth writes about, um, and then uh, rights and legality then becomes uh, the next stage is play, uh, where you're playing house and stuff like that. We'll sort of leave that there. And then the game stage is where you're like playing football or basketball or something like that or some other large multiplayer game, and that and that in essence that becomes the field where you learn about rights. So um, so rights go here, and then something like the generalized other stage is sort of linked up to this sort of um, this world of you of of, of ethical. Um, yeah, esteem. So love is singular others, um, rights is universalistic others, and this is particular others. So here you are getting esteem from the generalized other uh, because of the role that you're playing in the generalized other, something along those lines. You did a bad job with that, but we'll just leave it behind. So let's just jump into uh, chapter five. So chapter five, Patterns of intersubjective recognition, love, rights, and solidarity. So where we were at the end of last time is that is a consideration of Hegel's theory of recognition. And so what, Agam what Hanath is going to claim now is that there are essentially three forms of this or patterns that are, um, that are sequenced. Um, uh, so, it, so to him, it's sequenced in Hegel. It's sequenced in Mead, as we just saw. Um, so the first one is love. So a so this is two subjects who recognize themselves uh, in love, uh, say a husband and a wife, hi Judy, uh, or 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 a a, a parent and a child, um, or or good really good friends, right? And it, it's it's a it's a it's a relationship of really really strong emotion. I'll try to draw that with a lot of ties here. Um, so here's the so it's the first form of recognition. There's strong emotional ties. Ties is always small uh, small number. So this is really singular to singular, right? Um, it's usually mutually confirming or affirming, right? And you're recognizing in each other concrete needs, right? Both embodied needs, uh, whether it's um, uh, you know for parent child contact or for lovers or something, the embodied needs, and and emotive needs as well. Um, yeah, it's re recognized as reciprocal, that there's always a, a greater of reciprocity and kind of symmetry in it, even though the parent-child isn't. But it's being oneself in the other. That's the essence of love, being oneself in the other, okay? Um, and on page 96, he goes beyond Hegel into a, uh, a discussion of Freudian object relations. Um, again, we're, we're again the mother-child relationship is viewed as the ideal type, as it is in really all psychoanalysis, right? The ideal type of the love relationship. 
Um, it's usually characterized by uh, something like symbiotic self-sacrifice in the part of the mother and that the child is trying to develop something like individual self-assertion, right? So a securely attached child is going to become individually self-assertive um, and that you begin in, in, in a kind of symbiotic uh, a position of bonding or merger with the mother and who eventually through her self-sacrifice gives you up, detaches from you, and then you become um, you know, you know, uh, someone who's relatively independent. So self-confidence, which is a positive trait here, um, is a is considered the, the capacity to be comfortable alone, uh, comfortable being alone. So a well um, cared for child is going to be comfortable being alone and away from the mother. So this is sort of that whole attachment um, theory, uh, you know, it begins with like Winnicott and Bowlby and um, Ainsley and others. It's, it, it's, it's, uh, so, so that, that psychoanalytic attachment theory, um, so it's a developmental process. You begin in a situation of absolute dependence, infant does on the mother, uh, and then you move towards relative dependence, and then ultimately towards independence, again, through this sequencing of detachment. Um, every one of you has gone through this, right? Um, there's a psychological process that goes on um, in Freud's writings it, on, on mourning and melancholia and on the ego and the id. We talked a little bit about this when we did Butler. Um, the infant learns to self-regulate when the mother's not present, uh, by developing, um, uh, by mourning, so that the, the, the child develops a kind of permanent um, installation of the mother in the, in, in the psyche, so that when the mother's not there, you can imagine the good mother being there. Um, and so this is, um, you, you get something like object permanence that way, um, and that this allows the child to self-soothe, right? So a well-nurtured child is in a position of self-soothing, um, Right, and so, so if mother love goes wrong, however, on page one hundred six or one hundred seven, you can get all kinds of things that are are crazy. So any of the current literature on attachment theory, even secure attachment, its linkages to personality disorders, um, you know, sadism, masochism, destructiveness—that's the language of critical social theory. Uh, you know, Klaus Tavelite's writings about the soldierly male who has the desire to to obliterate by using annihilatory violence. That's a, a flaw of, of the basic fault in, um, in, in, in development. So personality, disorder, personality disorders of all kind come about as something goes haywire here. So what you wind up with is an inability to form uh, adult object relations, um, certainly healthy ones, uh, and you're not comfortable being alone, right? Um, so, you know, Fromm wrote about symbiotic dependence and sadomasochistic relationships. Yet, uh, Jessica Benjamin or Be Benjamin writes about it as well, cited here. Um, so the first generation, you know, Frankfurt School uh, studies of the authoritarian family fit here. What goes wrong in child rearing to lead someone to be really, really uncomfortable with freedom and to seek to get rid of it by bonding to a power figure or that then gives them power that they can then sadistically use on someone else, right? Something goes haywire here. So if you wind up with self-confidence, you're capable of being alone and you're capable of being interdependent and mutually responsive to others. Again, if something goes haywire, you can't. Page 107. So the second form of, so the first form of recognition then is love, this, uh, which leads to self-confidence, right? The second form of recognition is, is rights or legality, um, uh, deals with respect. Um, yeah, and love is always, by the way, a singular to singular, right? It's always a small number thing. We don't love everyone, uh, despite, um, yeah. And, 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 and rights and legality are universal phenomena of respect. So they're universal. Everybody in the society that fits the category who isn't homo soccer has them, basically. So rights refer to the mutual recognition on the basis of legal status as a person, right? So you have the legal ability to engage in contracts and vote and those kinds of things. Civil rights then are attached to this, right? Uh, you, you, so there's three kinds of civil rights identified on page 115. Civil rights, um, yeah, three kinds of civil right, of legal rights, civil, political, and social. Civil rights, the liberty of the subject, basically, uh, um, freedom from impositions of your life, your property, your privacy. That's a negative right. You're protected against uh, those um, impositions. That's civil rights. Political rights are the rights to participate in the formation of the public mind or the public will. Um, and that's a positive right. 
And then the third is social rights, where you have the right to something like welfare, guarantees of welfare, uh, a share in, in food and, and, and comfort and well-being. That's another positive right. So those are all legal rights. Uh, not all of them are well uh, um, defended here in America, but certainly in global uh, modernity they are. Um, so self-respect as an intersubjectively recognized person, uh, where you're morally responsible, uh, again, you get respect because of your status simply as a legal person, and then you get disrespect uh, by being denied it. So what's interesting about this category is that it really seems to me to have a kind of binary quality. You either have it or you don't. You either have legal status or you don't. So there's not a gradation or an evaluative quality like there is to the next category. So the universal category of universal, excuse me, the universal category of legal right is yes or no, either have it or you don't. The third category of mutual recognition is social esteem. Um, in ethical life, right, is where this exists, it's the recognition of traits, abilities, and contributions in one's particularity. So it's the overarching big other, the society as a whole, the ethical system as a whole, granting you value, evaluating you in a kind of qualitative way with lots of gradations. You're being valued somewhere along there uh, by the traits, abilities, and contributions of your particularity. So it's not directly you as an individual, it's you as a member of a category. So it could be um, like uh, as a member of a racial ethnic group, could come into this, uh, or like, like a set of migrants, or a, um, I don't know, when I was a kid, I was, taught, was told whenever I went on a school activity that I was representing my school somewhere. And so wherever I went and whatever opinion someone had about my school or my hometown, that was attached to me, right? That's that sort of idea that your esteem isn't something that you have as an individual trait, it's a social trait that comes through the intersubjective ideas about the group that you're a part of, about your particularity. So if you're in a particular calling, a particular profession, um, if you have a particular um, um, you know, position in a community or something like that, but a division of labor, so maybe your calling or your trade, uh, the particular religious group that you're a part of, the, the particular hobbies that you might be a part of, that each of these things has um, a kind of measure. That it, it's evaluated in the big other and that you will get differential esteem uh, um, which is a kind of a quantum of social recognition, a quantum of, of psychological uh, premium, something like that, uh, resulting from your um, from the membership in the community. So you can't do much about that as an individual. Like 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 I'm a sociologist in um, in. In, the, in, in academia, we're probably higher in status than, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something lower in status than sociology. Economics, we'll say, but, but, but probably lower than in status than, say, philosophy. Now, pay might be different, but in terms of, like, prestige, uh, we'll, 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 we'll go with that. I don't know. I'm making that up. But, but, but we'll say something like, like an attorney, like you're an attorney or, um, um, I don't know, something honorific, a doctor, a physician. Uh, you, you, you're, you're going to get a, probably a, a higher quantum of social honor given to you than if you're, say, a, um, um, I, I, I don't know, I, I worked at McDonald's, so maybe a McDonald's worker or something like that. I did that in high school, right? You're going to get a different quantum of social uh, prestige there. So social esteem, then, is, is the particularity, the particular field that you're in, the particular calling that you're in, the particular network that you're involved in. So it's differential. Uh, different uh, particularities have different amounts of social esteem, uh, different amounts of social worth, um, different recognition of differential contribution to societal goals. So substitute terms, prestige, status, status, honor, not status or honor alone, but status, honor, um, the style of life, as Weber says, uh, that, that has status, honor appropriated to it. So within a status group, um, within, there's going to be kind of a mutual symmetrical, symmetrical recognition. So, um, you know, every person who's a member of a status group recognize each other as relative equals, and that's solidarity, a recognition of self and the other among uh, those who are members of the same ranked status group. But between status groups, you're going to get different. Again, that's where the evaluation comes in. But it's not evaluation of a small singular, like one group of people against another. The, there's going to be a big other that has the entire evaluative matrix in it, and that each of the particularities is going to be rank ordered and, and differentiated based based upon that. So so again, like there's a rank ordering of professions, a rank ordering of majors, uh, a rank ordering of um, 
neighborhoods that you could live in and so on, and that these are somewhat disconnected from money. Now, this is interesting. Um, yeah, so page 125, it's not honor in, tra in the traditional sense. Not you, know, you don't get this from duels and fighting to the death or something. Um, and in fact, the struggle to the death, the honor that was associated with struggle to the death gets cracked open here and divided in two. You get dignity at the universal level, so everybody has dignity. But then at the individual level, you have integrity. So you get that kind of cracked open. But both of those are different. Those forms of honor are different from what he means by esteem. So that's prestige, standing from contributing in one's profession, calling, position, to in your particularity to the overarching uh, universal. Okay. So it's the struggle for social esteem, then, is something that is universal or perpetual in modern society, right? Um, other systems have much more rank status orders that are, are obdurate and can last for a long time. Hegel writes about, um, say, like in the uh, Lectures on the Philosophy of Religion, he writes about the caste ordering of, of, of Indian society, where the different castes have different amounts of esteem attached to them, and that these can be really ossified and not change for a long period of time. Modern society sort of liquefies uh, the status order, and so the particularity can shift quite a bit in terms of, uh, of amounts of power and so on. So it unleashes a kind of, not struggle to the death, but a kind of agonistic struggle, uh, competition for uh, for social value or social, social honor. So, um, yeah, so this leads to, you know, like right now, you know, in, in the middle of the pandemic, doctors are certainly getting a little bit of extra dose of social honor. First responders have since 9-11. At moments, teachers get it um, and so on. So there's, there's often changes that take place, struggles that take place uh, uh, that to alter the kind of ranking or the distribution of social honor to people in these different particularities. Okay, so page 127, social um, um, esteem is um, asymmetrical within the system. So, so, so all the members within the status group get about the same amount from the outside, but within the status group, there can be rankings within. So the singulars, the individuals within a status group can know each other as being better or worse at what you do, but largely to the outside world, the outward facing amount of esteem you're gonna get is the same. So um, are, are, are you a teacher, are you a professor, are you a doctor, are you a lawyer, are you a farmer, are you a, a plumber? Um, are you a, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a person who folds burritos at a, a, at a restaurant? Regardless of that, right, th you're gonna be rank ordered and that's gonna be constantly, um, um, you know, um, that, that, that being a member of that community, all or of that community, all of the outward facing uh, honor is gonna be the same. Doesn't matter whether you're really good or not, People are going to know what you are, and that's what you're going to be ranked at, okay? Okay, so it's not your singular individual amount of integrity that's at stake. It's the group esteem, okay? Group narcissism is the term that that, um, that Fromm uses to refer to some, some a phenomena like this. Okay, then that leads us to page 129. And let's take a look at this. So on page 129 is a kind of summary. Is a Gombin, uh, excuse me, Hannes summary of the argument. So, yeah, so he's going to have the mode of recognition. Here's love, right, is emotional support. Here is uh, legality, uh, cognitive respect. And then here we're going to have, um, you know, whatever this big one is, is ethical life out here, right? Okay, so love is singular um, and legal is universal. And the world of social esteem is going to depend upon your particularity. It's going to be particular. Okay. So the mode of recognition, emotional support, cognitive respect versus social esteem, the dimensions of personality, love is going to deal with your needs and emotions, uh, uh, respect it, and, and legality is going to deal with your moral responsibilities, social esteem is going to deal with the traits and abilities, right? So if you're good at what you do, you're going to get more, and if you're in a profession that's valued more, you're going to get more esteem. Okay, the forms of recognition. You get it in primary relations in the form of love and friendship. You get legal relations in the form of universal rights. And here you get solidarity in a community of value that's particularized. Okay. Uh, developmental potential, I'll kind of leave that out. Um, we'll kind of leave. Yeah, so this gives you basic self confidence, love does. You get self respect from your legal status, and you get self esteem from your group, uh, from your attachment to the group that has a certain amount of, of uh, social esteem in his. Okay. All right, and then the threatened component of the personality is your physical integrity, 
social integrity and honor and dignity. We're going to get back to them in the next chapter. So that's the basic schema. And that, of course, was on page uh, 129 in the book. Okay. All right, let's move on then to chapter uh, 6. In chapter 6, then, he's going to broaden out. So if those are the three forms of, 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 of recognition... Then chapter six is going to give us three forms of disrecognition or disrespect, right? So, uh, so disrespect arises when you refuse, when someone or some group refuses to give you recognition, or when you have misrecognition underway. Okay. So the first type, the violations of the body, which are the ones that he thought was associated um, with uh, the family life, right? Physical integrity. So physical integrity, what tends to be. Uh, at risk in love relationships, even he even writes about you know husbands and wives or children, you know the physical um, you know uh, damage that can be done of abuse and and so on. So so the violation of the body, and then you know let's just walk through this. Um, it's always humiliating, right, to have your body abused. It's always shameful to be bullied or to be beaten or to be abused, something like that. It destroys the basic confidence of the self and the capacity for love, play, and work. Right, you really are damaged. Uh, I, and, you know, when we did uh, uh, um, Butler's uh, book, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, traumatic body memory and some of the somatic therapies that are uh, in use today to deal with that. So we know about post-traumatic stress disorder and the way that the body is implicated in it. So even when one is humiliated, often the body keeps the score. Um, and when the body is damaged, you still get the psychological impact as well. So this tight connection between the relations of love in those primary worlds of family and love relations and, and, and the body. Okay, the second way you can be disrespected or misrecognized is the denial of legal rights, the universal rights. So, so the entire struggle for civil rights um, really fits here. So women's uh, uh, couldn't vote until until the suffragettes uh, um, got women the right to vote a hundred years ago. Um, the civil rights movements, the indigenous rights movements, the um, the rights for um, uh, equal equal opportunity um, that result from uh, from the feminist movement, uh, gay rights movements, and, and so on. You know that the legal rights denial of legal rights, right? So so this attempt to become a universal subject, to become a universal member of a community of, of, of right, right, of, of it is, it is what's at stake here. So the loss of this, being denied that, the loss of the universal moral respect, being excluded from rights, uh, loss of self, ostracism, uh, again, homo soccer in Agamben's terms is like a perfect form of this. These are people who have been denied uh, uh, legal rights. There's no legal right to protect you at all. All right, so you've been negated out as a legal adult, right? You're not able to engage in contracts. You can't buy and sell things. You can't, you know, um, in, in engage in the kind of activities that a competent adult would do. Can't vote and other things. So the denial of rights to like felons and so on fits within this. Okay, so this is going to be an, uh, the second form of disrespect that's linked to, um, yeah, the legal order, right? The universal legal order. Okay. The third form of disrespect, then, is going to be the devaluation of ways of life, of particular callings, of particular positions, of particular, um, you know, uh, identities, and so on. So here you're going to um, uh, lower social prestige. So so in this case, you're going to receive lower social prestige. Um, um, can't read that word. Social ranking of one's way of life. Uh, the particular group to which one belongs um, uh, gets devalued. And that means if it's devalued, right, if the thing that you do is devalued, then you can't relate to your own uh, internal self, right, your in-group uh, with self-esteem. So uh, you become deprived of social esteem, you know, vapors, um, you know, uh, psych the, the psychic premium one gets for being part of a group is lost because you're not uh, receiving that little charge or that jolt of, 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 of narcissism from being a part of of a group. So so if your group is devalued, let's say that you have a political movement that comes in that is focused upon devaluing um, um, refugees or devaluing uh, migrants from uh, from Mexico or whose whose focus is upon um, you know uh, denouncing um, people who live in cities or you know um, whatever the category is that as your group is devalued, the amount of social esteem you as an individual member of that group is going to get is also going to be lowered. 
So just being you, um, again, not as a result of anything to do with you as an individual, but just that the group that you're part of has been lowered. So again, again, we're, we're, we're back to the world of, of Fanon, where um, the, the, the colonized subject who stayed within the community that colonized had their self-esteem was fine. But the moment that they went into the European, um, uh, to went to Europe, or the moment that they went to the capital and entered into the world completely defined by the white colonizers, then you had this, this really, you realize just really how low uh, the group was ranked. So, yeah, so that, so that, uh, that idea that you're absolute evil, your absolute indigence and, and, and the other negative terms associated with it comes up. So that's social esteem. It's due to the particularity, the place you fall, the particular places that you fall that, or, or, or the positions that you occupy within a big other, within a larger order. So page 135, all three. So yeah, so he makes an argument, all three of these denials of recognition can cause somatic symptoms and all three can cause uh, psychological distress. So, so all of them are abusive, they're, they're, they're hard on the body and so on. 126, he writes about the motives for social con uh, conflict then prime, and for mobilization primarily being um, due to um, disrespect and, and misrecognition. So the reason why people engage in, in social conflict or mobilize social movements and so on, he's argued it really isn't because um, uh, primarily because of economic inequality. Um, it's really mostly, he would argue, due to uh, flaw, problems of recognition. Now, because he's folding in legal rights into this and that one of the legal rights is the, is the social right to... Um, to, to the basic goods of, of life, like, like money and, and, and property and so on. Um, because that's folded in there, some of the economic inequality and the mobilized mobilizations for economic reasons are included. But, um, but, but so his argument would be that people in a union or people in a workers' movement or slave revolts aren't going to be primarily about money or property or power. It's primarily going to be about respect. And, um, and, and so... Um, yeah, so so this squares with Fanon, page 134. Um, you know, shame and the have massive implications for self-concept, right? That being shamed, that all of these forms of misrecognition or lack of recognition are shameful, massively uh, uh, disorienting. And then and then as as um, Fanon wrote in both again, black skin, white masks, and and uh, the um, ra uh, um, wretched of the earth. That there is that this is going to be a motivator, a mover, right, for social for social conflict. That experiencing shame and humiliation, and um, that these things are radically uh, um, um, destructuring, and that um, and that, that 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 again in Fanon's terms, that there's going to be a secondary gain from engaging in social conflict, engaging in revolutionary activity, engaging in the violence of revolutionary activity. And it's redemptive. It's it, it's actually therapeutic. That that um, that you can that some of the damage done by living in a fundamentally invalidating, uh, devaluing system, um, some of the damage can be undone simply by resisting it and fighting against it. Um, especially if you win. Okay. So you, so the, if you go back to the graph on one twenty nine that we looked at, uh, um, we have Hanath again. Just just lines it up. So here's the. For the threatened components of the personality from the forms of disrespect, right? Abuse and rape at the in, in the family, denial of rights and exclusion at the legal level, universal rights, and then denigration and insult at the particular. And that these are going to be then motives then for um for social action, for social conflict. So chapter eight then, disrespect and resistance. Yeah, so the disrespect then is what's going to generate the resistance, is what's going to that's going to be the motive power, the moral power. Uh, behind uh, mobilizations and social movements, right? So, um, yeah, yeah. And, and so page 163, just to, I'm going to summarize this really fast. He writes about how social movement actors and social movement leaders and commentators and analysts of social movements can actually miss this, that they can actually misattribute the mainspring of action and that some of this may well be unconscious, uh, that people might be engaged in um, in a social movement and provide reasons for their uh, engagement 
And then underneath at an unconscious level, it might include, uh, you know, kind of a, a reaction to the shame of being uh, of being uh, disrespected or of being uh, having lower the denigration of low self-esteem. And, uh, you know, so, so if you're a gay rights uh, activist or, or a fighter in the gay liberation movement, um, your your activity, um, you might have very reasonable um, 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 rationale. Uh, motives that you're able to consciously identify but underneath it on Hanif that argue behind your back right behind the back of subjects is going to be this moral push coming from a lack of recognition and again even as someone who i'm I, i'm heavily steeped in in um in revel you know I, I used to i did an exam on social control and revolutions and i see this you know you know the french revolution um in, in many ways the french revolution was triggered by a lack of respect by um, by humiliating, uh, by by lack. So 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 what happened was that the third estate, the wealthy third estate, showed up at the at the estates general in Paris. And the first and second estate, the clergy and the aristocracy, made them stand. Right? They they arrived early and in a hot stuffy room. They made these people stand and wait while the you know the people with the fancy clothes on. Um, and long hair and, 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 and you know, uh, short britches and stuff, that they came in and sat in the front and uh, disrespected. And so it was that disrespect, that, that disrespect of using an old protocol that put the wealthy third estate um, and, and, you know, the striving bourgeois, I suppose, in a position of disrespect is what triggered the uh, breakdown and that led the third estate out and where they formed the National Assembly, you know, the Tennis Court Oath and all of that. So it was the disrespect, it was the lack of recognition uh, that led uh, the Third Estate to leave. And then there was a struggle for recognition that we know ended in the revolution and so on. So, so revolutionary activity can be triggered uh, by this. And uh, even though there was a, con you know, again, the, 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 most of the writing and most of the analysis of the French Revolution always find reasons for it that are deeper, but the triggering point came from a lack of recognition. Okay, so you can have an economic motive masking a moral motive and a moral motive masking an economic motive. You will both ways. 164, the secondary gains from conflict. This is where he talks about, I think, Franz Fanon, I think is in there. Where you gain respect and you gain kind of therapy uh, simply by, uh, by engaging in uh, revolutionary or resistance activity. Let's end it on page 175 then. So he, he writes about what, it, what an ethical society would look like. Like I said, it sort of looks, uh, um, uh, yeah, the forms of recognition associated with love, rights, and solidarity provide the interest objective protection that safeguards the conditions for external and internal freedom. This looks a lot like Fromm's sane society um, or the society that Fromm would like to have us move towards if we get out of one where people escape freedom. It's a society where people have uh, guarantees of positive freedom, right? So that your your love, your rights, your solidarity can be formed to get esteem from the contributions that you give. Um, yeah, the idea right here. Yeah, that idea of post traditional democratic ethical life, which we're headed towards, which is what Hegel wanted, right? Um, democratic ethical life that's being determined by uh, by relative equals, deliberating, debating, forming a, uh, a will, and so on, rather than being imposed on them by an external authority. But democracy, gen, you know, genuine democracy with a kind of muscular um, engagement of a you know of a, of a large polity that's deciding for itself, deliberating on its own, and so on, right? So the idea of a post-traditional democratic ethical life as it begins to emerge as a consequence of this sort of argument was first proposed by young Hegel and further developed on post-metaphysical premises by Mead. We'll leave that out. Um, despite their many differences, what both had in mind was the same ideal of a society in which the universalistic achievements of equality and individualism would be so embedded in patterns of interaction that all subjects would be recognized as both autonomous and individuated, equal and particular. So this is sort of the end game, right? Is that, um, uh, and this I think links in many ways um, Hanna's writings back to critical social theory of the first generation. Critics of fascism, critics of authoritarianism, critics of capitalism, these big structures that disempowered uh, everyday people, working people, and that made it difficult for people to live self-determining lives of, of, of um, 
that were that were more than simply meeting necessities that but, but that were free in the truest sense where people had the economic social and psychological um, wherewithal to lead self-determining lives right so Hegel wanted this uh, and wrote about this um, you know as uh, as really honestly as Napoleon marched across Europe in the beginning of the 19th century we're now over 200 years later and and um, and there are still movements driving forward this um, and since this will be the last of these videos for a while um, the it the if you look at the rise of anti-democratic movements or of movements that embrace authoritarianism totalitarianism you look at movements that attempt to disenfranchise voters that try to make voting more difficult uh, uh, actors who are actually um, um, trying to distort or pervert the political process um, so that politics itself doesn't function. Uh, a a top-down politics of hate, a top-down politics of distortion, a top-down politics of, of resentment, um, and so on, is, is, uh, is troubling. And, and what Hanath is pointing for, towards is the need um, between now and a post-traditional world of democratic mutual recognition are struggles. Struggles uh, like the civil rights movement, struggles like uh, the, 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 the feminist movement, struggles like the gay rights movement, struggles for decolonization, struggles for um, uh, environmental rights. That, that, that until we get there, this is what needs to happen. And so being attuned to um, misrecognition, being attuned to denigration, to a lack of respect, to a lack of esteem, and so on, being able to mobilize and bond and to have um, um, something like effective solidarity uh, is, is something that, that, that will get us towards a post-traditional uh, post future. Again, a critique here is capital is the primary subject of history, and at least history of our time and and there is a, a, a risk that it, that if we spend too much time in kind of micro identity struggling for recognition against each other um, that we're going to lose solidarity as working people um, capable of meeting the incredible power of capital so so um, from a that, that may not be my personal stand but from a Marxist um, uh, critical theory uh, stance. Um, this would be something to be concerned about. Is that is that, that that the struggle for recognition is well and good, but where does it end? And if it ends again with too many micro identities struggling against each other for recognition, and if you wind up getting nests and nests and nests of 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 ever smaller um, uh, identities, right? That that are struggling against each other for ever smaller pieces of social esteem, um, we're losing the bigger picture of a structure of domination associated with capital that feeds on the energy and the uh, labor of all. So, um, so again, there, there, there's a project that needs to be done between this book and, again, facing the real problems. I mean, it, it, but at any rate, it's, it, it's, it's a worthwhile book. Um, I enjoyed reading it, and I think it summarizes many of the, uh, the themes from the other books as well. I hope this was useful and um, uh, take care.